Hey everybody, happy Wednesday. Good to be with you once again. I can feel your presence even though we're not together. Uh, first of all, without a doubt, you've noticed my incredible haircut. Um, I've, I've had multiple folks tell me it's, it's out of this world, it's amazing. Uh, President Trump has called and, and just said it's, it's beautiful. He's never seen anything like it. It was performed by my wife yesterday on our back porch. And so she's thinking about going into black market haircuts. So check out the haircut. If you need one, price is right, $50. Uh, on that note, Beth Turnbow is retiring after 33 years of police work. Uh, congratulations to Beth and to Wally. And uh, wow, what a blessing. We're thankful that she's retiring and, uh, and has done such a great job serving in so many ways. Also wanted to mention, in case you didn't know it, uh, Tim Llewellyn has finished up his very own book, Avalon of the Heart. Good picture there of, uh, on the front of Tim and his uh, grandchildren and Tim and Peggy on the back. But uh, especially if you're a, a person from around this area, you might be really interested in this. There's some good reading, uh, interesting kind of life story, uh, highlights of Tim's life, and, and also involved his parents and grandparents, just uh, an interesting journey. Contact Tim if you're interested in that. Uh, it's a, a fun read. I'm on chapter five now, so uh, journeying through that together. I wanted to mention our, uh, our church secretary, Kathy Gentry's mom, Regine Gentry, uh, broke her ankle uh, this past weekend and had surgery Monday, a pretty serious break, and so she's recovering at home and doing fairly well. I uh, wanted to, a little shout out there to Dale Dillahoney. I know he's been having a lot of problems, and Dale, our th thoughts and prayers are with you, uh, so for your safety and, and for your health. Also heard uh, that Brian Benj's mom, Ellen, had a stroke and is hospitalized. So prayers there for, uh, for the Benj family, for Ellen, and for her healing and recovery. I understand it wasn't real severe, but she's got some things going on. Uh, Missy will be starting rehab for her stroke on Monday. Uh, so we're praying that that goes well. She'll be working with the rehab uh, out of Granbury and, and staying at home. I wanted to mention too, several families and people, uh, singles and others have volunteered to run errands and to deliver things. So if, if you have a need, uh, please let us know. Call the church office or call me or call one of the other ministers or elders and we will put you in touch with the person uh, that can help out. So if you're afraid to get out or if you, you know, really need somebody to take care of something for you, run get groceries, run get supplies, uh, let us know about that, and we'll be glad to serve in any way that we can. Um, also, uh, one of our members' family members, a son, uh, mentioned that uh, he's feeling a lot of stress and anxiety in his office complex in the Metroplex. Um, there are 11 people who have tested positive for COVID-19. He has not, and so just... Uh, wanted to include in prayers those who are working, having to work, and are in situations where it's really high risk. Uh, always think about, too, our medical personnel, our first responders, our firemen and police officers, ambulance drivers, nurses, uh, all of those that are dealing with people on a regular basis. Um, our hearts and prayers are with you. In fact, uh, we're going to stop right now and just uh, pray about that. Join me if you would. God, our Father, we know that you're powerful. We know, Father, that you are our healer, our protector, and our defender. And we ask, Father, for you to provide a hedge of protection around those that are working in difficult situations and at-risk situations. We just ask, Father, that, that you protect these folks, that you keep them healthy as possible, that if, uh, if they do contract this virus, that they recover quickly and are able to return to work and be with their families soon. We pray for health, we pray for protection, and we pray, Father, for peace and anxiety in this time in our nation when there is panic and when there's despair and when there's so much fear. 
Father, just help us to breathe and to rest in your arms. And tonight, Father, as we open your word, we ask you to open our hearts. We ask you uh, to bless each one out there that is thinking about you, opening your word, praying to you. Make your presence known. Help us to fill our hearts with your word and our, our lips with your praise. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, so tonight we are jumping into the fascinating uh, book of Judges. And a lot of times uh, you hear the word judge, and if you're an American and you're living to, in our world today, you think of the gentleman in the, the black robe that's behind the bench that's issuing out uh, judgments against criminals or judgments in court cases, things of that nature, uh, punishment to criminals, and that really has almost nothing to do with the judges in the Bible. The judges in the Bible were men and women called by God to step in to lead his people, usually in military action, as they were uh, finishing up the conquest of the promised land, the land of, land of Canaan, uh, that God had given to the children of Israel. Now, the judges, after uh, many times after the conquest, after the warfare, did serve as mediators, as helpers in decision-making process uh, between two parties in, in Israel. And so they served in some different ways. But most of the time when God called them, he called them directly to lead the children of Israel in warfare. And Judges covers a huge span of time. It covers from the end of Joshua's life and his death all the way to Eli and Samuel, uh, about 400 years of time. And during this time, there's about 12, 13 of these judges that God calls. They aren't kings and they aren't priests. They serve in a little different role than that. And as we journey through these, you're going you're gonna to pick up on some of that and, and realize what that's like. So what's happened so far? Well, the children of Israel have been led by God out of Egypt, out of slavery, into freedom. They have been through the wilderness for all those years, and they've entered into the land of Canaan. They've been, uh, Moses has passed away. Joshua, the book of Joshua is right before Judges, and that's kind of correct in the, the time span there. Joshua is now leading the people. Uh, Moses passed away before they entered the Promised Land, so Joshua is in charge, and they're coming to the end of Joshua's life as you open up the first chapter of Judges. So you kind of have to think about those things, and remember that God has already delivered his law to the people and that Moses has shared that and brought them to this point. He's put Joshua in charge. Joshua has taken care of kind of the uh, invasion, I guess you might say, of Canaan and the conquering of many of their great cities. And Judges is the period of time that picks up here. It's kind of a roller coaster spiritually. When you read through Judges, you're going to see this, this pattern that's, that's kind, of, it's kind of sad. And I like what J.D. Greer has in his study guide, and I wanted to just show that to you here briefly. You can see that uh, in this pattern, Israel has peace, and things are going well. They're obeying God. Then Israel stops obeying God, rebels against God, or does things differently than what God uh, has called them to do. And then God allows Israel to be punished. And the way often that he punishes Israel at this point is the folks who have not been driven out of the land begin to dominate them, begin to raid them, begin to uh, steal from them, and even overcome them in battle at time. So Israel then out of their desperation, cries out to God. Next part of the cycle. God has mercy. God is touched. When God's people cry out to him, he hears them and he responds. Even when 
they've been unfaithful. And so God responds by calling up or calling out a judge. And the judge then delivers Israel. And once again, they return to peace. But the sad part of the situation is then they go back through this process again. It may take 10 years. It may take 20 years. It may take 40 years. But they fall back into paganism. They rebel against God. They stop doing what God asked them to do. And God allows them to suffer and struggle and to have hardship. And so as you journey through the book of Judges, as you're reading the book of Judges, I want you to do that. Uh, journey through that with us. Every Wednesday night, we're going to look at a different judge. Uh, this next week, look at maybe the first three or four chapters as we enter into the book of Judges, and that's a lot. So take your time, and, and we're going to work through a little bit of that tonight. But the people of Israel seem almost, uh, I don't know, how would you say it, spiritually bipolar. That one day, they're doing great, they're doing super, they are serving God, they're faithful to God, they're, they're courageous in battle, they trust God. And then the next moment, they seem to be almost the opposite. Uh, and why is that? Well, if you look back to Joshua chapter 24, uh, one of the most well-known chapters in the Bible where it's the end, near the end of Joshua's life, and he says, you know, choose for you this day whom you will serve, whether it's the Lord or whether it's these other gods. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, if you continue to read in Joshua 24, you find out that's not just a statement that Joshua is making about his own house or himself. It is actually a calling out of Israel. And he expects a response from Israel. And he reminds them of everything that God has done. And then in uh, also in chapter 25, 24, verse 24, the children of Israel answer him, and they say, and I quote, We will serve the Lord, and we will obey his voice. Well, sometimes they did, and they were blessed, and sometimes they didn't, and God allows them to struggle. And that's kind of the picture of the journey of the judges, of the period of the judges. And so, why is that? Well, a lot of times you say, well, well, who is king? Well, actually, God should have been king. And we find out near the end of the book of Judges what the real problem is that begins way back with right after Joshua dies, all the way through the book of Judges. And it is that in those days, verse 25 of chapter 21, there was no king in Israel, and get this, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So no king in Israel, so guess what? Each person decided what was right or wrong. That's a recipe for disaster. We can see a lot of that in our own country today. You can see that clearly in secular humanism today. That if each person is allowed to call the shots, nothing is right or wrong. Everything is up for grabs. Now, who should have been king? Hmm, should have been Joshua? Should have been Moses? No, actually the way that God set up his people was that he would be their only true king. He might have prophets, he might send angels, he might have messengers, but God alone would be king. A theocracy is what that's called. But the children of Israel did not want that. What did they want? It was the worship of self. It was the love of power. It was the, I'll decide what's right for me mindset. We today, in our nation, are really struggling with that. And no one seems to know what's right or wrong because everyone wants to do their own thing. 
when we submit to God, when the people of God submit to God, there is blessing, there is peace, there is comfort. When we fail to do that, we throw ourselves into chaos. We need truth to live in peace. Now, let's think for just a moment about these judges. Uh, wow. I mean, they are fascinating. There is a spectrum of people here that are judges that you're going to run into uh, in this study. And I want to say this, the judges are very, very broken heroes, most of them. Some are cowards. Some are almost addicts. All are sinners. You see, God doesn't call the brave he makes the called courageous. And sometimes we think, well, you know, God, God has never called me to do anything. Oh, yes, he is. He makes his will known. He calls every believer out to lead, to step out in faith, even if that's just leading your family or your spouse or encouraging a friend or a loved one. He is calling you out like a judge. You can answer his call. You don't have to be perfect to answer God's call. You have to be willing. Because God doesn't just call the brave. He makes the called courageous. Think about that this week. Think about that in regards to your life, your, your work, your family. What area of your life do you need more courage in? And where is God calling you to? I want you to notice also here that as you journey through the book of Judges, you're going to see incredible pain and struggle and hardship. You're going to see crisis after crisis. You're going to see uh, death and sadness and grieving and joy and sometimes despair. Why? Because that's what life on this planet is like. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world infected with sin where there's greed and corruption and cowardice and these things influence and sometimes make life hard. Now pick up with me, if you will, in, in Judges chapter 1. In Judges chapter 1. And in Judges chapter 1, Joshua's still alive and there is a looking to see who's going to lead the people in this next conquest, and it is Judah that is called out. Judah is selected to lead the fight to the area of Jerusalem and that surrounding area. And, and in chapter 1, Judah has, in the first half of the chapter, he has victory after victory after victory. They, they go out and they engage the enemy, and there's courage, and they know that God is with them. So they go forward and they are victorious over and over and over again until verse 19. And it says, actually back up to verse 18, And Judah took Gaza with its territory, and Ascalon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. See, victory after victory. In verse 19, Now the Lord was with Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but... They could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had iron chariots. Wow. How interesting. Now, have the people of God ever had an enemy that had chariots before? Well, of course they had. Had they forgotten about where they came from? When they were leaving Egypt, and Pharaoh changes his mind and comes after the children of Israel. How does he come? With a peace treaty? No, he brings an army full of chariots. And what does God do? He dispatches the entire army into the Red Sea. The children of Israel cross on dry ground. The armies of Egypt pursue with chariots, and they're swallowed up because God closes up the sea on them. Yet here in Judges chapter 1, they give up, they stop fighting because they stop looking to God and only see 
iron chariots. Now, granted, iron chariots were like tanks today in our modern warfare up against infantry. And certainly, you know, that's a terrifying thing for an infantry unit to run into a tank and the, the damage it can do. And that's kind of the way they viewed chariots. That was terrifying to the people. But the reason was they didn't trust God. They were thinking, how can we handle this enemy with this weaponry? And they forgot about the power of God. If God is able to bring down the walls of Jericho, if God is able to make the sun stand still while the people are fighting, if God is willing to do away with the Egyptian army and their chariots, can he not handle the chariots of the Canaanites? So as we journey forward here, in verse 27, we see part of the problem with the situation is they did not obey God and remove the Canaanites completely out of the promised land. Verse 27, but Manasseh did not take possession of Bashin and its villages, or Tanak and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or Ibim and its villages, or Megiddo and its villages. So, get this, the Canaanites persisted in living in that land because the people of God stepped back because they didn't step forward in courage and in faith and in obedience to God's command God couldn't bless them and so when they step back the enemy steps forward he always does when you step back morally our enemy will step forward in your life Satan in this situation, the enemy is the Canaanites. They're pagan people who completely reject God and have uh, horrendous religious practices, including sacrifice. And so it came about, it says in verse 28, when Israel became strong, that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. So the Canaanites were more persistent than the people of God. And the people of God decided to compromise on what God had directly commanded them to do. I got to tell you, anytime you compromise the clear teaching of God, you're going to find yourself in confusion and chaos. And that's where Israel finds themselves in a mess, in a disaster. J.D. Greer states that small areas of disbelief lead to large areas of disaster. The people of God said, hey, look, you know, we've conquered most of the land. We, we've taken the, you know, we've got 80% of the land is ours. They're, they're only on about 20% scattered here and there. But what did God say? Drive them out completely. So that little area of compromise ends up being large disaster on a long-term scale. Kind of interesting that Jesus spoke about a similar mindset all the way forward in our Bibles in Luke chapter 16. Remember that passage? where Jesus says, he who is faithful in a very little thing is also faithful in much. But he who is unfaithful in a little thing is also going to be unfaithful with much. And so what he's teaching is little things matter to God. When God is clear on something, we obey all the way. We don't hold back. We don't assume it's okay to vote another direction or to leave that out of our Bibles. We say, God, whatever you teach, I'm in. And I'm all in. The problem with the children of Israel, they weren't all in with God. The going got tough and they got going. And they gave up. And the Canaanites stepped forward. Jesus goes on to say, in that passage, 
you can't serve two masters. You can only serve one. And that was true in the beginning. It's true with what's going on with Israel here in the judges. It's true in our lives as well. Man can only have one master. You're either all in or you're not in at all with God. So what did Jesus mean by this? What do you think he meant? He who is faithful in a very little will be faithful in much. I think one of the things that Jesus brings up here is that the proving ground for doing great things is in how I handle the small or what I might think of as insignificant things in my daily life. You know, do, do I always try to tell the truth? Do I always do my part and more? Do I pay my bills on time? Do I keep contracts? Uh, do I blame other people for my failures? Do I take things that aren't mine? You know, ran into one guy who said, well, my boss is rich anyway. He won't notice if I take a few things. What? what? How would you like to be the boss? And all of your employees have that mindset. It's kind of like litter. If all 8 billion of us throw out a gum wrapper, that's a lot of litter, isn't it? Little things matter. Little bit of poison. Little snake bite. Little bit of evil. Little bit of unfaithfulness. What about if you're a student and you're asked to take a test and you can see the answers of the person sitting next to us? Are you going to be faithful in the little things? Are you going to do your own work? Are you going to steal someone else's and call it yours? And you think that Almighty God doesn't see this. Am I going to be faithful to my marriage when I'm out and about, when I'm traveling, when I'm not in my hometown? Am I going to be faithful to my wife by not looking at pornography? Be faithful in the little things and God will bless you with greater and greater. Well, in chapter 2, God, I guess, is, seems to have enough. And so he sends his angel. And a lot of times when God sends an angel, there's some good news or an exciting announcement. But I got to tell you, this time in chapter 2, when God sends his angel, whoa, it's bad news. And here's what he says. Now the angel of the Lord came, verse 1, came up from Gilgal to Bochum. And he said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. And it came about when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the sons of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. The first thing I want to point out to you is that God always communicates well. And if we're in doubt, we seek the Lord. We open the word of God. We ask God in prayer and he will communicate. He communicated with his people here. They had wandered off the path. And he even says to them, I was going to drive them out. I was going to help you, but you have disobeyed me. And he made that clear through his own messenger angel. And when the people realize why there is failure, they weep. But in this passage, maybe it's conspicuously left out, maybe not. There doesn't seem to be any repentance. The people don't weep and say, hey, we've done this wrong. Now, let's go forward and let's drive them completely out. No, that doesn't happen. They just lift up their voices and weep. You know, there's a difference 
between human sorrow and godly sorrow. Just plain human sorrow, I, I can cry because I got caught. I can plead, I can, I can beg for mercy, I can be sad about that. But godly sorrow drives a person to change, to change of heart, to change of mind, and to change my actions. So the people lift up their voices and weep, but they make no changes. They don't repent. What a message this angel brings. So as we bring this part of our study to a close, I want to encourage you to continue reading the, the book of Judges. Consider these questions maybe with your group or with someone you're, you're nearby. Number one, what areas of fear are you dealing with? Now, the children of Israel saw the chariots of iron, and that caused them fear, caused them to doubt God. What is it that causes you the most fear and anxiety? Number two, could it be that God is testing your faith? You know, when you read the book of Judges, some of the struggles these people have are a test of faith. They are a calling out of God. Number three, what areas of our life, or I guess you'd say our land, our spirit, our heart, need to be completely cleaned out? Are there any strongholds that you're dealing with that just frustrate you? Have you shared that with anyone? Have you asked anyone to pray about that? You don't, you don't have to announce that to the world, but James says confess your faults one to another and pray for one another so that you might be healed. So what areas of our life need spiritually cleaned out like the Canaanites needed removed? Number four, who is spiritually leading you? And who's spiritually leading your home? Is it Joshua? Is it Judah? Or is it the Lord? Number five, how can you step out and become more of a leader for God? I'm excited about the book of Judges. I hope you'll continue on this journey with us together. And I just pray that God blesses you, that he watches over you and keeps you safe. Until we meet again, God bless you.